Good evening. I'm Grace Lynn Guile and welcome to Restoring Health Holistically. This evening's guest is Jeremy Ponte, and he is a trigger point therapist and human movement restoration specialist. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, Jeremy obtained a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from the University of Rhode Island. He is certified by the National Academy of Sports Medicine, the Functional Movement Systems, along with CPR um, approved from the American Heart Association. In 2004, he worked as a certified personal trainer at Advantage Personal Training in Mystic, helping college athletes and clients recovering from physical ailments. In 2007, he joined Lawrence and Memorial Hospital in Old Saybrook as an exercise physiologist, rehabilitating, rehabilitating patients following strokes and cardiac incidents, or those struggling with diabetes, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and other chronic conditions. In 2011, Jeremy joined Pre Precision Fitness in Pawkatuck, which specializes in using corrective exercise trigger point therapy to enhance performance. Reverend Valerie King recommended him when I began having severe calf muscle spasms after playing tennis this summer. She had been unable to walk beyond the parking lot of her residence, but after working with Jeremy, Valerie is able to walk miles, including a very steep hill up to her home. So that's how I became acquainted with you, thanks to Valerie. Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. How did you get interested in this kind of therapy? So back in 2004, I started as a personal trainer. And um, as I was training clients, I started to notice that, you know, no matter who I worked with or what exercise I had actually prescribed for them, they were still in some pain. Whether it was the knee, the hips, the ankle, the back, they were always in pain. And so, you know, I would take them through the exercise program and let's say it was a leg extension. They say, well, Jeremy, that hurts my knee. I would say, okay, well, let's modify this and let's take it to a different exercise. Same thing, oh, it feels a little better, but the, it was never, yes, this is good, it feels great. Mm -hmm. So it became an ongoing process. Finally, I said, there's got to be something here where these people shouldn't be in pain. Okay. And I started okay. to notice that there are people that were the same age, but didn't even have half the issues that these individuals had. And they were in great shape. Mm -hmm. So um, I talked to my boss then. Um, and he had mentioned, he said, well, there's a seminar coming up. It's in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. I'm sorry, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, these guys, there's this new guy that's doing this breakthrough therapy. His name's uh, Gray Cook. So I said, well, it sounds interesting. So he's like, well, what do you think? Do you have any interest? I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. So I said, well, you know what he's going to be talking about? He goes, well, it's different. It's right up your alley where it's about getting people out of pain and moving movement patterns and how uh, um, he improves the whole human movement spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I was hooked and um, that's how I got started. So it was, it was great. So who were the founding mother and father of trigger point therapy? It was Janet Travell and David Simmons. Uh, Janet Travell was actually the physician in, in the White House when uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson were mm -hmm. in presidency. And um, she had done trigger point therapy um, studied this back all the way in 1938, but the first documented case was 1942. So okay. it's been around, around a long time, and um, just, I, I guess, apparently along the way, nobody really paid much attention to it. And so, so um, what percentage affects the musculoskeletal um, system? I mean, what, what you're talking about is a, a systemic treatment yes. rather than just uh, let's treat the injured part, yeah. but there's a whole system that's involved. Sure, it affects about 85 to 90 percent. So that's, it's a big number. Uh, it sounds physical, like yeah. <laughs> Okay. And, um, yeah, that's, and, and the way it uh, works is that it uh, communicates with the nerves. So when you have a trigger point, it actually sends an electrical current. Through the nervous system. Through the nervous system. And so you can't nerves. just treat where there's that one point. There could be the, a completely different area. Oh, again, well, everything in the body is connected. It is. <laughs> it's so true. It's funny how that is. It is. <laughs> okay. So how does uh, dysfunction in, say, the knee um, impair human movement? And then what do you do to, to correct all the, that system? Sure. Uh, so what we do is I, I'll break it down. I look at the ankle first to make sure there's mobility. And then I look mm -hmm. at the knee to see how the stability is going. Then I look at the hip mobility. And then I look at lower back stability, 
uh, shoulder mobility, scapular stability, then all the way up to the neck. So if the moving parts are right, most likely the stable parts are going to be stable. However, if the moving parts are either locked up or there's a dysfunction, then the knee's going to take the pounding and be sacrificed between the two, like the hip and the ankle. Okay, so, so the, that little process that you described, you're going to come back to later as part of screening. Yes. Okay, yes. so when a client comes in, you screen all those to see what's, what the system is doing. Absolutely, and that's what it goes back to the functional movement screen. It's a movement profile on the individual. Okay, so it's, um, so describe that functional movement screen and this grading system. Sure, it's, a, um, it's an evaluation of the body from head to toe. It's on a grading scale of zero means pain, one means there's, a re, uh, there's a, either dysfunctional restriction or better to call it a muscular imbalance. Mm -hmm. Two means it's an acceptable level, three means it's exceptional. Okay, okay. And so then you, um, so you look at the movement patterns and then explain the way you assess the, um, what's the dysfunction. Sure. So first things first is you look at the hips first. That mm -hmm. is the most primitive pattern. So we're going all the way back to when we were babies. And on our, and, and not walking up on our hind legs or? Yeah. <laughs> so all the way actually down where you're just lying down on your back. Okay. So we were babies. That's the first motion. We were down on our backs. We learned how to roll over. Mm -hmm. We learned how to do like, a, it's called a soldier crawl and mm -hmm. they're crawling. So going back to the screen, that's what they're assessing first. So it's, uh, looking at the, uh, the hip, pelvis, and core, and that's assessed through doing the um, active straight-legged raise is the actual name of the screen. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at the ability for the individual to lift up one leg, so the mobility of that leg to, lift up, to be lifting up, and mm -hmm. the stability of the opposite leg to stay on the floor. Okay. So it's not a hamstring test, that's what people don't realize. Okay, so it's a mobility test. Yep, it's everything. It's mobility, stability, um, static motor control, dynamic motor control. Okay. And then, um, so let's say, describe where you begin with a client first. And then later on, much later on, we'll begin to demonstrate. Because we've got, um, w what we're going to do is we have about, um, we have about a half an hour to talk about what you're doing and why. Yep. And then we're going to spend about 15 minutes with you doing some demonstrations. So we have quite a bit of time here. So talk sure. about the program design and, the, and how you work on the most primitive pattern and go into quite a bit of detail. Okay, absolutely. Uh, so what I do first is I'll client comes in and um, I'm going to screen them. And the first thing I do is I'll do the screen, the active straight-legged raise, which comes number one. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to look at their breathing. Um, what's interesting about breathing, it affects multiple systems in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, people have acid reflux, people who've had shoulder issues, hip issues, mm -hmm. it's all connected, uh, diaphragmatic issues, uh, it's all connected to breathing. Uh, it, the most probably interesting fact about breathing is that most of us breathe through our chest and shoulders, mm -hmm. and when you do that, you're only using a third of your lungs. Right. So if you ever look at the human body, the lungs are, they're, they're huge, they're, yes. they're big. Yes. So when you really think about it, it's pretty amazing to know that you're only using the top third part of the lobe when you have all this useless space you're not applying. Um, so when you're checking their breathing, you get them to breathe properly. And what I do is I place them down on the floor, mm -hmm. lying down on their stomachs, mm -hmm. and it's called crocodile breath. And what they're doing is they're basically, their hands are folded this way. They're lying down and their forehead is resting this way. Uh huh. <clears throat> and then what I do is, as you breathe in, you're gonna fill up the stomach with air so that it's actually putting pressure into the floor. And then as you exhale, it's gonna be coming off the floor. So it's, to, it's uh, kind of taking that, um, you know, everyday breathing you're used to doing, mm -hmm. it's all of a sudden changing you to back to when you were a baby. And, it, so. and do you think we, we learned to, when did we learn to do this superficial breathing instead of using our whole diaphragm? So there's been a host of things. They said it could have been trauma of some sort, whether it was a car accident, a disease, uh, oh, so not everybody breathes superficially. Nope. So some people actually still continue with that diaphragmatic breathing. However, mm -hmm. to be honest, I haven't really seen much. Well, they wouldn't come to you because path. they wouldn't have a problem. Yeah, because they wouldn't know, yeah. <laughs> right. But it's tough unless you screen them, you don't know whether they are breathing right. But right, right. I think it's pretty safe to say that a majority of people, the population, do breathe through their chest and shoulders. Uh -huh. Unless they've been singers. Unless they've been singers, exactly. Uh -huh. Or public speakers where they learn to use the whole diaphragm. Absolutely, absolutely. But how does this, um, how is this diaphragm movement then, because we're not breathing, then what happens because we're not breathing fully? 
So what happens is that it actually will lock up the hips and lock up the shoulders it's because it closes the space in between where the thorax is. So you have your diaphragm, looks like a parachute muscle. Uh -huh. um, when it's not really activating, you're using just the top third of the lobe of the lung. What you're basically doing is, when I look at the back of the scapula, we're basically dealing with, I'll show it from the camera, probably this much movement. Okay. So here's a diaphragm under here. Well, as the diaphragm activates and drops down, I've got all this space coming, and now all of a sudden I've got all this movement for my scapula to move, which in turn is connected to the shoulders. So all of a sudden my shoulder moves better. My okay. hips move better because actually my deep uh, core musculature can actually activate. Does this have anything to do with the, the rotator cuff? Absolutely. Oh, because uh, so many people nowadays are having rotator problems. Yep. Yeah. And uh, another inter uh, interesting fact about the rotator cuff is that um, we have no control over them. And you'll see people actually, you know, it's great, it might look good, and they're doing this for uh -huh. extra rotation on this. But um, to be completely honest, that's not how the rotator cuff works. They're actually stabilizers. So they only contract upon reflex. You have no control over them. Oh, so okay. A good test is I always tell people, flex your bicep. They go and flex your bicep. Right. They'll flex your rotator cuff. Well, how do you do that? It's like, <laughs> you can't. You have no control. It's like you're breathing. It's okay. a subconscious, subconscious uh, reaction. So it's the body doing its own thing. <clears throat> exactly. It's the body stabilizing it. Yeah. And what is it stabilizing? I mean, the it's actually, back? Yep, it's stabilizing the arm bone <clears throat> into the shoulder socket. Uh, okay. So that you're able to move the arm in a full range of motion. Okay. okay. So when there's, uh, when it's, there's some type of maybe restriction. I want to lock up. All of a sudden, I'm like, it becomes painful because, a, there's a reason why this is acting up again. Going back to the breathing, mm -hmm. b, trigger points, mm -hmm. and uh, c, poor posture. So all the combination. Okay. Becomes we all like, slump. We all slump. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Slumped over our computers yes, these exactly. days. <laughs> okay, so so sit. Up, we want. We need to sit up straight, yes, we and do. we need to <laughs> breathe deeply. Yep. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, just because so many people are having rotator cuff surgery and things, can, uh, tr does trigger point therapy help, bef uh, not maybe with a torn rotator, but before you, if you have a, a sore shoulder that's due to the rotator, can you help release that with the trigger point therapy? Yep, absolutely. And that's one of the uh, neat things about it is that, um, depending on the severity, the different grades of tears, mm -hmm. um, if it's perhaps maybe a grade one or two tear where the uh, orthopedic will not want to do surgery and mm -hmm. it's going to refer the person out to do some kind of therapy, yeah. then yes, it actually can uh, provide really good benefits. Trigger because, well, releases. the body is designed to heal, and so if it it's is. a small enough tear, it should be able to heal itself if it's yes. given the right fuel and, you know, in the terms of food and nutrition and Absolutely. protein. And also if it's, um, you know, if you give the exercise that would help enhance the oxygen to that space. That's exactly how, it, yep, that's exactly how it goes. Okay. Yep. All right, so then, um, so then what? So then after I check the breathing, I um, go through the motions of soft tissue is pretty much the driver of the car. And He's tell people what soft tissue is. So that's gonna fall under trigger point therapy. Soft tissue, um, if you don't mind, I'll demonstrate here. Okay, There's quite sure. a few tools I use. All right. Uh, this is called a quad baller. This is right off of uh, trigger point therapy site, tptherapy.com. Okay. Uh, a really neat site. If those of you are interested, please Very look it up. informative. Very informative. So tptherapy.com. Dot com, you got okay. it, yep. So this is a tool that I'll use for the calves or the thighs. And then this is a tool that I'll use myself on the client, where basically I will get maybe down on top of the shoulder or the thigh. If they can't bear to place all their weight on the roller, mm -hmm. then I'll come over with the stick. This is called the original stick. And I take it and I just roll out over the muscle, whatever okay. it may be, the thigh, and shoulder, calf. So when there's a knot or a restriction in a muscle, you use these devices to help roll that out and smooth it out. Yep. And we're going to demonstrate that at the end. But I just want yes. people to understand what these... Um, devices do or yes. what they're for yep. okay so continue yeah. and then there are other ones here which you see here uh -huh. uh, the smaller rollers is specifically designed for the calf and then you have two balls that we actually use for the glutes and look about like tennis balls yes tennis ball a little bit firmer almost the probably the density of a lacrosse ball uh -huh. um, and the fabric is meant so that you don't slide so if you get on a slippery floor like this, you're not going to slide off of it. Okay. And then it comes with a baller block. So the baller block gives you leverage to actually dig a little bit deeper into the tissue. And um, now depending on what the, t the uh, client can tolerate, um, you want to slowly ease them in. 
Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes yes, this is you, you too were slowly aggressive. easing me in. <laughs> yes, right. So sometimes it's too aggressive. So what you have to do is have this roller here, which I have. Um, this is called the grid uh -huh. trigger point therapy roller, and um, usually just have the client rest there. This is a little bit softer, mm -hmm. a little more okay. forgiving. Okay, so that not quite as painful. <laughs> yeah, okay, exactly. less torture. Less torture. Yeah. Okay, all right. And um, so after I've done that, and I'm releasing the, um, so when I'm going back to the active straight-legged raise, what you want to do is you're going to roll out the back of their legs. That includes the calf, the back of the thighs, the glutes, and the lower back. Oh, okay. The entire okay. thing, the entire fascia stemming from the feet all the way up towards the lower okay. back. Okay, explain what the fascia is. So fascia is just uh, a fancy word for connective tissue. It's okay. this dense tissue that uh, the that the covers sur surrounds every single muscle in the body. Okay. And um, years and years ago, they used to disregard it. They had thought it had no connection to human movement, in which it, it just, does. Just held things in place. It just held things in place. That's what they thought. Okay, but now it's an active player. Yes, it's an active player. So as the tissue loosens, that muscle's got a lot more space to move freely under it. Okay, and so. so that helps to free up the motion. Yes. And what happens is that things get constricted and stuck. That's exactly what happens. So let's say to your typical example of having night cramps, mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest That's things. That's what was in happening success. in my legs. Yes, After trigger point. tennis. Yep, trigger point therapy is uh -huh. works wonders for it, and. Um, I thought it was a magnesium deficiency at first. Yeah, and that's the thing. When it constricts the muscle, these type of issues arise. Mm -hmm. You start to become deficient in magnesium. Well, um, I, I'm not sure that I even was. I think I just overused that muscle, but maybe that created a deficiency. Yep. I don't know. It very well could be. And that's the neat thing about trigger points. They do cause a lot of, like I mentioned before, they tap into all systems of the body, circulatory, respiratory, uh, the nervous system you name it, vestibular system. So. Okay, are we going to talk about that some at some point? Oh yeah, absolutely. At some trigger point? Yep. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, so we. I think where did we where did we leave off? We're in the, you were doing the legs, the the, the thighs, the back? Yep. Okay, now And what? the glutes and then the lower back, and then okay. what I do is I rescreen them, check their leg raise again, mm -hmm. um, and I will demonstrate at the end. Okay. Leg raising is I'm just holding the stick, I'm measuring the middle point of your kneecap to the top of your hip bone, also known as the ASIS, if for those people that are watching that are that interested are in the this. medical yeah, right. terminology. Okay. And uh, basically what I'm, I'm going to put it in between those two points. And if your ankle, your outside ankle bone, can clear the stick, that's mm -hmm. a three. If it falls between the stick and your opposite kneecap, that's a two. However, if it falls below the opposite kneecap, it's a one. And what, is, what do those grades mean? So the grades are just telling you um, with the stability and mobility of the hips, pelvis, and core. Okay. And uh, what you're looking at is to balance that out first before you go into anything larger in a movement pattern sequence. Okay, so you're looking to balance out the basic stance. Yes, stepping, first. lunging. Yep. And then you work into the smaller or more individual muscle areas? Yes, and that's what happens when you work on the most primitive patterns. Okay. They most likely will improve the bigger ones. Like okay. a steep squat is the last thing to be addressed in the movement screen. Okay. So if you take care of, let's say, the active straight legged raise, and then you move on to shoulder mobility, then we go on to rotor stability. Um, usually those primitive patterns mm -hmm. improve your deep squat, which is pretty interesting. So okay, well, well I, I, I experienced that, yeah. so I don't doubt you, but <clears throat> so I think part of it, you have to really see this while we're talking about it, too, yes. but that's a, we have to put this all at the end because it means we have to get up and move our mics around and do another rearrangement. So we're going to rearrange the furniture at the end of the show and talk a little bit and demonstrate this then and get all of this other conversation yep. in the meantime. It right now, price sounds a little uh, Okay, so confusing. you've talked about static motor control yep. then? Yep. Okay, and are we on dynamic motor control? Yep, so we're um, under the mobility box. We're, that's a comes to the soft tissue. Uh, static motor control comes to where it'll be a half kneel stretch with a dowel. You could use a broomstick if you're at home and you'd like to try this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing, by the way. If you want to try this right now as we do it, go for it. It gives you instantaneous results. What tools will they need? They will just need a textbook. Which okay. Place right here. You don't need a very high one. About so an inch. About an okay. inch or an inch and a half. Okay. Got it. And uh, a pillow to squeeze between your legs. Okay. Um, so it's a great test for those of you who haven't touched your toes perhaps in 15, 20, 30, 40 years. I will guarantee you'll have instantaneous range of motion where you'll gain inches like that. So, so it's if they neat. if they 
they'll try to touch and they measure that and then you give them some exercises to do the which will demonstrate and they can do and then try to touch again and they'll see how much range of motion they've gained absolutely okay so that's coming up yeah. um, so okay so dynamic motor control uh, reinforcing the corrective strategy yes so um, the soft tissue enables the window of change the static motor control, dynamic motor control exercises, and the strength training are the ones that are going to be enacting the change. So I'm opening the window of change with the roll with the soft tissue, and then I'm enacting the change with the static motor control, dynamic motor control, and the strength training. Okay. And it's a systematic approach that you um, have to abide by, uh, where most of us will jump the first three steps and go right to strength training. What do you mean the first three steps? So what, what is most, go through that a little slower. Yeah. What does it mean? So let's say the first box is the, uh, you, it's the mobility box. Well, you have people that have lack of mobility in multiple areas of the body, and therefore they're sacrificed the static motor control, which is the ability of the body to actually, the, nervous, the uh, neuromuscular system to communicate and to perform activities. Okay. Then the dynamic motor control is the body's ability to actually be able to take some kind of an external stimulus and still be able to function and communicate and stabilize the body. Okay. So um, best analogy I could use is, um, you know, you have a, you have a computer and mm -hmm. uh, this stuff is the software. My arms and legs are the hardware. Uh -huh. Well, if I'm just going and doing my daily routine, I'm not really changing anything. Right. If I start to enact change here by installing new software, then that's what's going to help me communicate with the hardware to change the whole movement pattern of me okay. going to the gym. Okay, so what in, in the trigger point therapy <coughs> the analogy that you're using, what is the new software? The exercises or? Yep, the, the whole system. To, to go through the whole system, to go free through. up the whole system. Exactly. So you're basically, well, clearing viruses, but not really, I mean, at, exactly. in the computer analogy, you're going through the system to get rid of all the gridlock. Yep, instead of, you know, rather than you just hitting safe mode all the time. <laughs> so I can't install the new software if you're not going to be able to uh, adapt to the changes that I'm going to instill. So. Okay, um, okay. Uh, but that's how it goes. So it's a mobility box, static motor control, dynamic motor control, and um, strength training and going back to the typical um, individual who exercises they have a lack of mobility and mm -hmm. all the other boxes I just mentioned and then they go right to strength training well what happens is that you're taking a dysfunction and let's say you have a, your knee hurts mm -hmm. suppose that you're thinking well I have to do some more squats I'm gonna do some lunges because I got to strengthen my quad I have to strengthen the knee area yep. yeah and to be honest you actually can do more harm than good because you're not dealing with the systemic dysfunction that's Ex causing that. Exactly. So you're making it worse yep. instead of addressing the system. Exactly. So you're addressing part of the picture, but not looking at the whole picture. The, you know, so. this is really interesting, Jeremy, because um, holistic healing is um, partly what I advocate because partly holistic doctors look at the whole body first. Yes. And then they look at the individual symptoms to give them clues as to where there's dysfunction throughout the whole body. Yep. And they're not just looking at, uh, conventional medicine tends to look at the symptom and give you a pill to treat the symptom, yeah. but never go and ferret out the cause and treat the cause and get rid of the cause and then therefore you don't have to take medications for the same symptom for 25 years if you've addressed the underlying cause. Absolutely right. And this is the same thing, only yep. it's with the fascia mm -hmm. and the whole muscular skeletal system. Yep. So, that's it's right, yeah, that's it's funny great. how they're all kind of connected with each other. Yeah, and I obviously didn't know anything about trigger point therapy until Val sent me to you. So, yeah. um, so this is a, a whole new area for me. So, yep. um, how does, so let's talk about uh, how the change is occurring in the body then when you do this uh, let's start at the when you do the be basic beginning and sort of follow it through the system sure so in the beginning um, when you're going through all the motions of the program um, let's say the actor straight legged raise you're a one you can't get a pass drops a kneecap well one of these uh, exercises is going to change that particular screen right on the spot so you're looking for pretty much I call it the magic one Mm -hmm. that your body needs that responds to that particular movement pattern to improve it. 
And what's interesting about it, let's say I do the soft tissue, but it's still not making a change. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly fine because there's a checklist that I go by and I just move on to the next box that's going to be the right one or the next exercise, I should say, that will be the one to change mm -hmm. your active straight legged raise from going from a one to a two. And then once I do that, then I can flip the page and really start enacting a lot of change. Because this is telling you where the hang-ups are. Exactly. And so then you can go through the system to address each of the hang-ups. Because yeah. probably there was one, uh, like an injury or an insult or a, a repetitive behavior that caused one to hang up. And then when that didn't get addressed, it went down smart to a smaller area in the system and then it just continued to get uh, multiply exactly. down line. Yep, just okay. like it metastasizes into a, even a bigger issue. So you go from something very small to all of a sudden just com being something completely big. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's interesting, um, you know, when you're looking at human movement because the human body has a phenomenal way of healing itself. And I don't think we give it enough credit as we should. Um, it's just, it's an amazing machine how it can, I just, every day this amazes me how you can change somebody's movement pattern in no time. And how quickly, how quickly we can well that was the it. thing yeah. in the first hour that I spent with you uh, you increased my range of motion a lot and you in decreased the pain that I was experiencing in the calf a lot just from that one um, hour yeah, it's so it that was really surprising big. but it didn't stop I mean then you told me that I have to keep doing this for a while till you get yep till eventually <laughs> the like like I mentioned till eventually your body picks up the changes and then again it's taking that new software then it's putting it and driving it, communicating with the hardware, and that's it, it's golden. That's neat about it, neat thing too. I love the word neat, because I feel like this stuff is, every, every day it intrigues me, but for somebody who never touches their toes to always be able to touch them, I uh -huh. think it's phenomenal. What other therapy, what other avenue would you take that could get you those results? I've tried everything and uh, could never touch a t my toes to save my life, even oh, when really? I was in high school. Really? Oh. And I do you know bad. why? And do you know what the original, originating problem was? You know, I, I suspect it was just uh, the twist. I kept spraying my, uh, or twisting my ankle all the time, and it was just like a vicious cycle. And then after that, it was, I felt like my body's going to rip in half. I was in great shape, don't get me wrong, but I didn't move very well. Huh. So I pulled my quad in half, and I completely tore my quad, pulled my calf, pulled my hamstring, you name it. I was a dysfunctional mess. So. <laughs> Your system is really out of whack. But it was way out of whack, so I said, <laughs> my God, I need, I need help here. <laughs> so, but this got me back on my feet, and I can honestly say right now, I think I'm in the best shape of my life. I, I mean, even playing soccer, I just, the movement that it provides me is just that. I can't explain it. It's just phenomenal. So it gives you that flexibility, and is, does it improve flexibility? Absolutely. It improves okay. everything. That's what I love. It taps into all the systems of the body, improves everything. So okay. my balance, uh, flexibility. Um, even running, I mean, it's amazing somebody, you know, I'm 34, mm -hmm. to be able to run with uh, kids that are in their 20s and 21, 22, it's, uh, it's mind-blowing, you know, so it's, it's reassuring for me to say, wow, this stuff really works. Yeah, that's great. You know, without great. having to get hurt on the field. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, um, you have some books that, do you, do you recommend these? Yes, I would. Um, the first one, it's uh, the Trigger Point Therapy workbook. Uh -huh. uh, this was written by Claire Davies and um, she bases off the um, system from Janet Travell and David Simmons. Okay, so the original. And, um, yep, the founding mother and fathers and it's a great book. Um, real quick, I'll show you what a trigger point looks like. Okay. So yes. what we're looking at here is... Well, I can't see that. Oh, we can't see it, okay. Yeah, the light's too bright. It's okay, no problem. bouncing off, but... Basically you just have the muscle fibers and a trigger point is either going to be size of a macaroni pea size to a pickle size mm -hmm. and what it does it just it's a particular part of the muscle fibers that actually stays contracted so that every time you want to move it never releases it always stays tight oh so that's what holds your muscles in place so that's what's actually yeah the, so your muscles have the ability to lengthen and then shorten so when you have a trigger point is it never wants to lengthen it gets short it gets weak okay so that's what happens so in order to actually break that up is when you're doing the soft tissue you're applying some kind of pressure and then whether it's a roller or the stick mm -hmm. and what it's doing it's eventually taking a knot that's like this mm -hmm. to all of a sudden getting back to the fibers to slide smoothing back it again. out yep to slide okay. it back again yep. so that and a great example i'll make this very short and sweet um here's a band mm -hmm. not that you're 
muscles are actually tying it up, but let's say the knot is the trigger point, right? And this is how it is. So you go to the gym, or you go play uh, tennis, baseball, soccer, whatever it is, softball, and um, you're going to grab right. one end of my muscle, I got the other end. Okay. So this is the entire muscle. Now we're both going to pull. What happens to that knot? It gets small and tight. Yeah, and tight, exactly. Did it ever loosen? No. That's a trigger point. So okay. basically what I'm doing is as the pressure is applied from some kind of a soft tissue therapy, it's going to basically undo itself to where this is how your muscle should be. You're pulling one end. They're able to extend mm -hmm. and return back to their original shape. Okay, so, so contract and expand. And expand, yep. Uh -huh. So that's basically what's going on at a um, cellular level. So okay. With uh, trigger points. Yeah, so, how many trigger points are in the body? Oh my God, they're everywhere. Oh. They are everywhere. They, it, it's, it's as early as birth. That's what's interesting about it. So these beautiful babies coming out are, so have every already muscle, have trigger points. Every muscle has. Every muscle, and it's just from overuse. Um, being in certain positions, posture, you name it, trigger points will occur, especially if they're stuck in a steady state all the time. Um, and the um, other thing about trigger points, there's a few types. There's um, active meaning, as soon as you press on it, it, it um, kind of screams pain. The second one is called latent. It doesn't, re it doesn't um, elicit any pain unless you push on it for maybe 10, 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting is everybody says, well, that would be anywhere you press. No, it's not. You can press on several areas of the body where there won't be any pain. So trigger point actually refers pain. You have active, latent. Satellite means I'm pushing here, but also I'm shooting pain over here. Oh, that's through so, the nervous system. The nervous system. Because that's really the nerve, not a, m necessarily a muscle being. No, the muscle. The muscle is the actually muscle is sending an electrical current. So the nerves oh. are the communicators. So the muscle is the messenger. Okay. The messenger. So they're trying to take the message and sending it off, I'm sorry, to the messenger, which are the nerves. Okay. So if the muscle is becoming dysfunctional and then it's all of a sudden in a state where it's staying contracted, what it does is it actually will send electrical currents. So that's communicating with the nervous system. So the nervous system is basically the messenger saying, hey guys, we're in pain here, are we going to do anything? Telling the brain and the body, hey, are we going to change anything here? And nope. And then, you know, same situation. That's what I was talking. doing. Yep. So. <laughs> my, my calves and my legs were saying, no change, no change, yeah. <laughs> exactly. until they so. met you. <laughs> so okay. this is, uh, yeah, but going back to the book, great book. It's called The Trigger Point Therapy Workbook, Claire Davies. This is, it's phenomenal. It's an easy read. It will help you. It guides you through, you know, if you have mid to low back and buttock pain, you flip the page. It'll take, give you a list of all the muscle groups that contribute to that. And okay. then all you do is you just refer to the page number, and it will actually teach you how to actually self-manipulate so. and get rid of it. Great, so, yeah. great. And then the other book, that's a good read here, real quick. It's called Movement, and uh, this is actually the um, organization I'm certified by in, by in. It's Functional Movement Systems. And it's by Gray Cook. Gray Cook, who is an absolute genius. Uh, Gray Cook is the uh, gentleman who actually came up with this along with Lee Burton. But Greg Cook uh, started the system out of a nursing home. Oh. So it, that's how it started. He went in a nursing home and um, was trying to figure out why these people couldn't move. He's like, how could it be that these people are getting wheeled into their rooms and you don't have to watch them for four hours. They could leave and they're still there in the same place. All of a sudden, Greg Cook comes in and he starts to develop this whole movement pattern system. And believe it or not, I got people from wheelchairs and walkers to walking on their feet and just Actually, they were really upset with him because he created complete Mobilized. chaos. Complete chaos <laughs> Mobilized. Mobilized everybody who had been sitting around. <laughs> exactly. So, they, I mean, they went from having people doing nothing, all of a sudden they were walking all over the place, chatting with this one, going in this one's room. So, it was complete chaos. <laughs> so, for the administrators, this was chaos, but for the people, it was freedom. It was freedom, absolutely. Freedom so. to be mobile is, um, well, it's right up there with having your own car, too. Absolutely. It is. It's right along the lines. And, you know, like Gray Cook says it best, you move well, you'll move often. So. The body's meant to move. Yes, and if you have pain, you move less, and then your pain will, your muscles and trigger points will tighten up. Yep, and it just becomes a vicious cycle. Okay, so. well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break here, and we're going to reset the stage, and I'm going to be the uh, client, as I already have been, and uh, Jeremy's going to do the talking, and he, we're going to together demonstrate what uh, we've been talking about so that you get a visual. Um, some of us learn from listening, some learn from, most people learn a lot from watching. So we're gonna let you watch for a few minutes. So we'll be back shortly. Going back to the movement screen, let's say Grayson's my new client. She's coming in. 
Um, so the first things first is I'm going to screen her. So I'm going back to the active straight-legged race. So what that looks like, I'm going to ask Grayson to lie down on her back, feet together, toes pointed up towards you. Okay. And I'm going to come over. And if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to measure the middle point of your kneecap and the very top of your hip. Let me know if you're ticklish. It's always good to ask. <laughs> no, I'm not. So you're here. And basically, I'm going to find the two, or I should say, I use my two thumbs to find the middle point of the kneecap in the top of the hip, and that's where I'm going to place the stick or the dowel. Um, from here, I'm going to have Gracelyn in the anatomical position. That means lying down on her back with her palms facing up. So she's going to have both her palms facing up. I have a little feedback on the sound. Keep going. Okay. Um, so we're going to turn your palms completely up. Yep. And if you could, Grayson, I'm going to have you start. Uh, when you're screening the individual, I want to give them three tries per leg. Uh, first try, they're just getting used to it. By the third, it's really a good indicator of what, really what's going on. So I'm going to give you three tries on your right leg, Graceland, three tries on your left leg. And you want me to go how far up? You're going to go as high as you can go. So if she clears the dowel, that's a three. Um, if Graceland landed between here and her opposite kneecap, that's a two. If you had landed here, it's a one. If that's as high as I could lift? If that's as high as you could lift, yep. Okay. So again, which is excellent, by the way. You've got exceptional mobility here. Hard earned. So, excellent job. Um, so I'll have you two more tries. Okay. Yep. And then back down. So it's clearly a three. I'll have her do it again. Good, just to make sure. Yep, you're good. And the left one. Okay, good, it's a three. I'm trying to hold this completely vertical. Good. And one more try. Good. Now, not only am I looking her lifting leg, but I'm also looking at her stabilizing leg. So if we notice that when Grayson lifts up, let's say, her left leg, and I notice that this happens, she has to compensate by lifting this up, you want to catch that, okay? Because they can cheat. The, hum the uh, <laughs> human body is a great compensator, so they'll figure out a way, a great adapter and compensator to actually figure out how to achieve a certain movement. So that has to be completely flattened down. Yep, and up. Good. Now, let's say... Gracelyn is a one, and her right leg is a three. You're obviously dealing with a significant asymmetry, so we need to address that. And as I mentioned before, so we're going after the most primitive is all the way back to when we were infants. So we're gonna balance out the pelvis first before we move on to any other uh, screen and body part. So what I will do, first and foremost, I'm gonna ask Gracelyn to sit up into a uh, seated position, and I'm just gonna have you take a deep breath for me, Gracelyn. And what I'm looking at is her, if you notice, she's actually breathing through her chest and shoulders. So we're going to reverse that. And real quick, this is what I'll bring the client down onto their stomach. So if you wouldn't mind doing that for me, uh, Gracelyn, real quick. And just to give you a little visual of how you should be breathing. Again, if you'd like to practice this right now at home, you're more than welcome. Um, you're going to lightly fold, or I should say, slip your fingers between each other. Okay. There you go, and lie your forehead on top of them. Yep, so we're going to, when you're um, at home, you're going to lie down. Fingers are this way. Forehead's resting on top of your fingers. Elbows are out. Your chest should be flat on the floor, including the rest of the body. And what I'm going to ask of Gracelyn is if she could breathe through, in through her nose, out through her mouth. And I'm going to take my two hands. And what you'll notice here is that naturally this is going to sit a little bit higher than this hand. If you're diaphragmatically breathing, all of the breath is going towards the lower part of the abdomen and the lower back. So as I'm observing Graceland, I should see only her lower back moving, not her middle and not her upper. If any of these upper and, mid and uh, middle parts are moving, that means she's still breathing through her chest and shoulders. We gotta make sure we reverse that. Once we get this, you can actually change shoulder mobility, hip mobil uh, mobility instantaneously. So I'm gonna check Graceland's breathing. Um, not only should I see the lower back rising, but the sides of her abdomen should be expanding, her obliques. And if she's doing this correctly, hopefully you can see this on camera. Here's my top hand, here's my lower hand. My lower hand should be rising almost to the level of the top hand. And Grayson, do you feel like you're able to take a deeper inhale? I, I think when you're I'm breathing? about as deep as I'm going. Yep, because that's what you're trying to do is actually activate the diaphragm. So you're going to go from 
shallow breathing to actually breathing very deep. I feel like I'm breathing in my tummy. Yes, and that's where the breath should be. So again, this is called a crocodile breath. It comes from yoga. It's a great exercise. Some people do this on their backs. Um, you could practice it that way, but personally, the best feedback right now is the floor, and you'll get that when you're breathing. So you'll know you're doing it right because if you're, if you're breathing diaphragmatically, every breath you take in, your belly is pushing into the floor, and then it's coming off the floor. Um, it might be a little hard when you're doing that on your back. Okay. So. Are you talking to the camera? Yep. All right. Um, say we've got you cleared there. I will now ask Graceland to um, just relax there. And I'm going to take my stick. This is what I refer to as a soft tissue um, trigger point therapy. Again, you can use the stick. You could have the client use the roller. There's different types here. Um, and then the ball will use for the glutes. So for the lower leg and the hamstring, uh, the calves and the hamstrings, I'm going to use the stick. For the glutes, I'm going to have uh, Gracelyn use the trigger point therapy ball. And then her lower back, I will use the, the uh, stick as well. So I'm going to start here at Gracelyn's calves. And when you do this, you're adding about 7 to 10 pounds of pressure. And believe it or not, these are like my GPS. This is going to tell me where the knots are because I'll feel smooth muscles and all of a sudden really taut and hard. And you feel that, right? And again, I'm not going hard. I'm not giving it the white knuckle pressure. It's very light, but that's all you need because this will talk to Graceland. You feel that, Graceland? Yes. Okay, how about down in here? Not so much. Okay, notice I'm trying to do one leg at a time. And I'm rolling it. Yes. Okay. Anything in here? I can feel yeah, something bumpy. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So again, trigger point therapy, it's painful, but for good reason. That's where the dysfunction is. You need to get rid of in order to enact change. Otherwise, you're going to be hitting a crossroad. So this is healthy, right? This is healthy. <laughs> this will actually improve circulation, by the way, too. This is good for me. <laughs> Surprisingly, yeah, right? People are like, geez, how is this good for me? It hurts. So again, I'm going to go towards the back of Graceland's thighs. Anything hurt there? No. Nope. Okay. Again, I'm just rolling out everything from the heels up towards the lower back. Rolling pie crust. It's exactly what it is. This is like <laughs> a roller. So everything feel good here? Yes, yeah, it does. Okay. I do notice though, her calves are a different story. Now, when you're doing this too, not only do you want to do the outsides and the backs, but you also want to do the insides. And a lot of people actually don't pay attention to that. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to elevate Grayson's leg here. And you can go ahead and rest it. And I'm just going to lightly do the inside of her calf. And she's going to let me know if there's any pain here. If it's just as painful or not as painful, it's always good to check. Uh -oh, and, yes. Okay. Am I stuck on my toes down? Yep, you're going to have your foot relaxed. Whenever you're doing trigger point therapy, the client must remain relaxed. If they're under any tension, you will not release it. So you got to make sure, as painful as it is, you got to make sure that they relax. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just rolling it. And I, a little bit of pain there. Yep, and I can feel a lot of tight areas here, top bands. So I can tell that this muscle is not really happy every time she steps with a foot. So we got to make sure we clear this up. So that's what I do for the inner. And once... Uh, I'm done with Graceland's calves and her back of her thighs. Um, I'll move on to her back because I'm going to have her use the trigger point therapy ball. So what I'm going to do is you're not going to roll over the spine. You're going to go either to the right and left of it. You're going to get into these muscles that it's called the erector, erector spinae. So the base of the muscles that run from the lower back all the way up to the neck. Oh yeah, this side of my neck has got an issue. Okay. And again, this could be all connected towards lower leg dysfunction. That's what's neat about it. So if there's dysfunction here, not only is it going to show up here, but it might show up here. And your body's like a big X. So if you've got an issue on the left side, it perhaps could translate to a particular um, restriction on the right side. So your body's a big X in the front and a big X on the back. Anything tender here, Graceland? No, it feels good. Okay. <laughs> so good. So I don't really feel anything that's too bad in here. Again, the calves are a different story. Mm -hmm. They've taken a beating. Yep. And one of the calf muscles, uh, a little uh, human anatomy fact here, is that there's a muscle called the soleus. It's actually the second pump of the heart. It's responsible for pumping venous blood back to your heart. 
So when there's serious dysfunction, uh, dysfunction there, you'll notice where you'll be Anywhere? getting either night cramps. There it's actually right here. So here's your, here's the calf, mm -hmm. which is also known as the gastrocnemius, and then underneath it is a soleus. It runs underneath the, these muscles here. It goes underneath and around. So that's the soleus. And then it, tell me again what it does. So it's responsible for pumping venous blood back to the heart. It's oh. considered the second pump of the heart. Learn something new every day. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, Grayson, if you wouldn't mind, I will have you in a seated position. And I'm going to have you take this trigger point therapy ball. Okay. And you're going to take it, and I'll demonstrate on camera. What you want to do right. is you're going to take the ball, place it right on your back pocket, okay. and you're going to sit on it for me. Okay. It's a pretty low pocket. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, right now it's getting okay. into the piriformis. So like this? Yep. Do and, you want uh, me to do it? Around so that the ball sure, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so pocket. Yep, right on the back pocket. Again, you're putting it right there. Okay. And you're going to sit on it, and then you're going to shift all of your body weight onto the right side where the ball is. So we're going to make sure that the. Um, I haven't. You have to. Okay, I have an idea. Yep. So basically, if we can see on camera, we're going to have this this way. We're going to shift all the way, and then we're going to switch legs there, and okay. have the left knee bent, okay. right leg straight. Uh, let me know if anything hurts there. Oh, I can little feel soreness. it. Just you can feel it. Hurt. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to work the range of motion here within the parapet. So you're going to bring the knee up and out, mm -hmm. and then come back. Mm -hmm. And let me know if that makes it hurt more. Yeah. That's okay. Good. So that's telling us that the piriformis is restricting hip rotation. Okay. Uh, external rotation. Good. And one more. And then you're going to have a slight bend in your knee. You're going to rest on your heel, and you're going to swing the leg in, and you're going to swing it out. So we're looking at. Abduction, yeah, abduction. Yeah. Okay. Good. And you can do this about four or five times. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we're going to switch. And the different sides are different. Different sides of your body are often different. Absolutely. When you do um, any kind of exercise, whether you're doing rolling, stretching, or exercising, always work both sides of the body. Never just ignore one. Don't just be focused on the side that's pain, because a lot of the times. That's actually not the faulty side. Okay. Even though it's in pain, but it's actually could be the opposite side. Tell me what to do here again. So, yep, no problem. You have it on the left side. You're gonna you're in the right setup. You're gonna bring the knee up and out past the hip at an angle. Yep. So up that way. There you go. Okay. Excellent. You got it. Yep. And does the left side hurt? Yes. More so than the right? Um or about yeah, equal. Probably. Okay. But this is I, I always get a catch in this hip. Okay. So that's a clue. A clue. As I say, there's always a mystery in the history. Okay. Okay, now we're going to slightly bend the knee, and you're going to swivel in and out on the heel. Yep, resting on the heel. And any pain there? Mm-hmm. Okay. So again, this is what I do first before I move on with okay. the program. i got to make so sure... this I, is part of your screening? This is part of the mobility... Yep, so this is part of my screening. In the mo um, right now, I'm working in the mobility box. Okay. So we're, we are... And have we have that slide up um, that have the different boxes? Yes, we could place that up, absolutely. Um, could we have, there it is. There it is. So as you notice, I'm doing screening was the active straight-legged raise. I looked at the breathing. Now we're moving on to the mobility box, which is the soft tissue. And um, I'm going to show you the leg lowering real quick and the toe touch progression and the half kneel uh, rotation, chop and lift. Okay. And eventually the dynamic motor control. And um, if we get to a strength training, but again, the okay. most important ones are probably the top four, or the four there listed. Okay. All right. So I'm going to have you lying down. Grisland. All right. And you let me know after doing the soft tissue stuff. Um, I'm gonna have you. I'm gonna do the straight legged raise again. You're gonna lie down oh, on your back, okay. toes up. And again, I'm gonna measure this one more time. There we go. Okay. And I'm gonna have your feet together, toes up, and you're gonna lift your right leg. Let me know if it even feels a little looser. Yeah. Does okay. Same thing with the left. Okay. She looks pretty good. Okay. All right. So now, let's say that did the trick. I'm going to have you staying right there. This is the leg lowering uh, phase in the mobility box. I'm going to bring Grayson's leg up to a right angle or to wherever she feels a comfortable hamstring stretch. Okay? You don't want to overdo it. Just leave it right here. Uh, for those of you at home, you can rest this leg right up against the wall and have the other leg resting on the floor. And with her resting leg, Grayson's going to lift it up. Let's just say 10 reps, but we'll stop at five. So you're going to lift up your left leg, match it with your uh, right. Yep. One, two, three, 
four. And do you feel a stretch in both legs? It shouldn't be just one, but hopefully you'll feel oh, it in yeah, both. Okay, yep, you got it. Take a breather. And now I'm gonna bring you to the toe touch progression. This is the neat one. So for those of you at home, try this. Unless you have a steel rod in your back, then it shouldn't be an issue. Um, so what you can do is if you're home, you can grab a textbook, inch and a half to inch uh, thick. And we're gonna have Graceland do it. She's gonna get her toes up on the uh, book, okay. feet together. And if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna have you squeeze this block between your inner thighs. The reason being for the inner block is that actually in this particular pattern of touching the toes, her inner thighs are hardwired to her core. So every time she reaches down, she's actually stabilizing her back and not causing any, any kind of damage or trauma. How, how is the toe? So, yep, as far as close as you can get them without falling off, there you go. And what you're gonna do is you wanna squeeze the block, mm -hmm. lightly bend your knees and reach for your tippy toes. You can go all the way down. You should feel a pretty good stretch there. Good. And then you're going to come up, and you're going to make the letter Y. There you go. Yep. Okay. YMCA. YMCA, right? <laughs> and then you're going to do that again. Okay. Squeeze the block every time you reach. And you'll notice you'll be able to get closer and closer. So for those of you that are just stuck here, that's okay. Practice this, because I'll guarantee you within two, three minutes of doing this, you might even get to here. Okay. Good. So let's say you've done 10 reps of those. I will not have your heels elevated on the book. Still with the block? Still with the block. So the reason for this is that actually, right now I'm telling you the world isn't flat. We're going downhill, and in the one before you were going uphill. Okay. So we're making, what we're doing is we're actually tricking the brain and reprogramming it. This is not a flexibility problem, by the way. It has nothing to do with the it's hamstrings. It's programming the brain. It's programming the brain, yes. It's a, it's a pattern problem. Okay. And so in order to prove this. Oh, I go down? Yep. Good. Make the letter Y, and we'll say one more, and we'll say you've done 10, good. All right, and then I'm gonna take this away. And then if you're at home, what I would do is just take your, uh, you're gonna step away from the uh, book or whatever you have, maybe it's a two by four, keep your feet together and see if you actually did get closer to your toes or perhaps you might be able to touch them. It should feel a lot easier. So it's, it's really neat, it gives you instantaneous range of motion. Um, once we're done with that, then I'll move on to the um, static motor control stuff. Uh, so, for here, Graceland, you could use a broomstick at home. Again, I'm attacking her hips, pelvis, and core. If you could, I'm going to have you kneeling this way. Okay. This stick will be resting on top of your shoulders. Okay. You want to make sure that your knee is underneath your hip and your left leg here is at 90 degrees. Okay. And what you can do is just stay nice and tall and you're just going to rotate. So these are some nice take-home stretches for everyone okay. who's watching. Yep. So we're going to turn only to the left. You always want to turn to the leg that's in front. Good. And what this is doing is actually stretching multiple groups in one shot. So again, I'm looking at movement patterns. I'm not looking at muscles in isolation because the human body works in patterns, not in isolation. So we're stretching multiple muscle groups in one shot. Do you feel a stretch anywhere, Grayson? In the lower back. Okay. If you could straighten out more so that if you can see Graceland's knee, it should be right underneath her hip, and that might make a difference. Okay, and I'll hold this just in case. Balance. You might want to stay next to a wall. Five okay, yep. Yeah. And you're going to turn to the right. I mean to the right, to the left, my apology. And you really want to focus the, on the client staying nice and tall. Good. Do you feel a stretch in the thigh at all as well? Um, a little. Okay. Would you mind switching legs? Because I know that was stretching the, um, felt the stretch in the lower back. Let's see what happens on the opposite side. This is what's neat. The human body, it always works in different patterns. She might feel a different stretch turning towards the right. Stay tall. Where do you feel that, Grayson? You feel it more in your left thigh? Um, I feel it a little higher up in my back. Okay, higher up in your back. And, um, and some in the thigh, yes. Yep. Good. And we notice, so she's getting kind of different responses on different sides. And this is why it always goes back to make sure you do both sides. Great job. Okay, the next one, then we'll go and in jump into, so that's the static motor control. Now I'm gonna have you do more of dynamic motor control. And this is getting somebody to actually restore their hinging mechanics. So what you wanna do is, if you're at home, 
you're holding the dowel this way, or the broomstick. One hand's behind the space of the uh, neck, and the other behind the lower back. My feet are about hip to shoulder width apart, and basically what I'm gonna do is push my hips back and bend my knees, and then lock it forward. So if we can see, I'm keeping the stick. I don't know if you can see me grasping, but it's not stuck on my head, mid back, and my yeah. tailbone, low back area. And do you notice that I'm hinging? This is the best position for your spine. You're not doing anything to your back. It's all in the muscle. The load's in the muscle. It's not in the back. It's a big difference between uh, this and this. See? Now that's not good for your back. Okay. This is completely different. This is so safe for your back because my spine is in a straight line. It's, yep, it's in its optimal position. And then eventually from there, if you're building on, then you go to strength training, then you just, you could grab two dumbbells or two kettlebells, you just balance on one leg. And sometimes I'll come over and I'll hold the, yep. Sometimes I'll come over, if Gracelyn, if you wouldn't mind holding the stick and placing it on my head, mid back and my butt. Like this? You got it. Okay. So I've got my, let's say two kettlebells or dumbbells. And basically what I'm gonna do, after I've done all the motions, remember, this is the last step. I'm going down on one leg. This is my rudder, the right leg, I come up, and then I lock it forward. Okay. Notice how I should be able to stay on that stick. So I'm stuck to the stick. That's extremely important, crucial for bi the biomechanics to aspect. To be able to do that. To be able to do that, yep, okay. big difference. Two minutes. Okay. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, I mean, that's how I break down the program. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to lose my glasses. So, um, yeah, so uh, going back, it's, uh, you want to make sure that you have proper mobility first. Make sure that you have the static motor control, dynamic motor control before you hit the gym and just jump into weight training. Because honestly, it could do some serious damage and I think a lot of us are unaware of it. So again, for all those of you watching, just please be careful. Um, again, if you do have any kind of pain of any sort, always uh, consult with a physician first and make sure you're not dealing with anything torn or that could be an underlying condition. Uh, once that's cleared, then perhaps seek somebody like myself. Thank you so much. Anytime, Grayson, thank you. I like the free massage and even yeah. some of it was a little painful, but I know it's for a good cause. I hope that you all will join us um, next week for another episode of Restoring Health Holistically. And thank you very much, Jeremy, uh, for this wonderful exposition. Oh, my pleasure, thank you very much. I appreciate it, it's an honor. Good night.